Welcome to Crime Solvers, where we pick a crime and then analyze the means, opportunity, and motive to help solve the mystery. Here are your hosts, retired police officer and crime analyst Dale Lawrence and journalist college professor Dave Radigan. Hey, I'm Dave. Across the table from Dale, we're here with Crime Solvers Episode 2. Maybe you remember us. Maybe you've come over from our other podcast, Inside the Line, Real Stories by Real uh, Real Cops. Uh, we're glad you're here. And we've got a great one. We've got a great one. It's an old one. Here's the basic info. January 26, 2011, 27-year-old Ellen Greenberg was either killed or died of suicide, stabbed 20 times while alone in an apartment that she shared with her fiance, Sam Goldberg. Ellen was a teacher and Sam was a television producer. They lived in the many young section of Philadelphia in the Venice lofts on the sixth floor of that apartment building in a part of Philadelphia known to have one of the lowest violent crime rates in the area. At the time of the death, Ellen was found alone in the kitchen area of her apartment with the only logical entry point into the apartment being the front door, which was allegedly locked from the inside. There was a porch to her apartment, so entry could have been gained through there. However, as mentioned, it was the sixth floor and it was during a nor'easter, a snowstorm occurring at the time of her death. I don't know, Dale. Maybe you would have been able to get up there. Well, maybe a Spider-Man type individual could have done that. And that, and that leads us right to our first thing about our podcast. As a former crime analyst, you need to look at a situation objectively. So I'm going to throw out two things right away. All right. You mentioned originally, just a minute ago, that the only way to get in there, not through the door that was locked, but to scale a six-story apartment, You're right. which is not logical. However, I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios when I was in law enforcement. We had a guy, it's like three in the morning. He's on the third story on the roof of a building he had yeah. just broken into. He ran up to the top floor, was out in the roof. We had the building surrounded. There was a couple of trees probably within 10 feet of the roof of the building. We ordered them to come down. We had a dog coming. The dog wasn't there yet. He jumped from the roof out 10 feet, jumped onto the branch of a tree oh. and scaled his way down the tree and was gone. We never even knew who he was. He was wow. gone in the darkness. Wow. So there are Spider-Man types out yep. there. We had a guy that we thought was kind of locked into a certain apartment complex. We went into the building yep. originally. We lost him. We figured he went up into the attic. Yep. We secured the area. It was a row of apartments that were all connected. There was around 10 or 15 of them. When we sent the dog up there, about a half hour later, he wasn't there. So what we did was we went up there and all the apartments, their roofs and the attics were all connected. So he went from one apartment and he went about a hundred feet down to around 20 apartments and he went through the inside of each apartment. The, the crawl space? The crawl spaces. And we got him at the last apartment in oh, that you building. Did get him. Yeah, we did you get him. him. He wasn't getting out, but we didn't know where he was. So there are people out there who can escape and can get into buildings when you would think they could. So this case is back in the news. In 2011, Ellen Greenberg was stabbed 20 times. It was ruled a homicide. Then it was changed to a suicide. Yes. 20 stabbings in a, in a locked apartment by herself. 20 stabbings, nor, nor 10 to the front of her body, 10 to the back of her body, her neck area. How does she reach the neck area? We're going to get into that, Dave. All right. We're going to look at the case through the eyes of how a crime analyst, you, Dale Lawrence, might approach the investigation. Ultimately, we're going to break down the case to its most basic level, look at all the potential possibilities. And in this case, there are only two possibilities. There is suicide and there is homicide. The official ruling, as we said, was suicide. As of right now, it's suicide. And, and the reason why the case is back in, in the news is because Ellen's parents filed a civil suit and it's being heard as we speak right now in the Philadelphia court system. So they're going to come down with a finding at any point going forward. This week? It could be this week. I, I would doubt it. They're going to come out with a finding. It's either going to be changed to homicide or undetermined, or they may keep it the same as suicide. So we're going to give you all the facts and you can make your own decision because we're going to have a conclusion at the end. And here's a fun fact. A person is twice as likely to die at their own hand. Absolutely they are. Than homicide, which is interesting and kind of disturbing. Y yes, it is. And that's why, like I said, as a crime analyst, as a police officer, 
You need to be able to have a parallel investigation. Even though you may think that one of the possibilities is not possible, you still have to have an open and objective mind. And I just, like I said, that fact is just out there. More likely suicide <laughs> like than homicide. You say an open and objective mind, but I know you. You think everybody's guilty. You well, start yeah, off, we're going to get into that too, Dave. Absolutely. Everybody's guilty. Most cops do look at it that way. Most cops go in, you think you, they think you're guilty, and then you've got to prove. Well, if you, if you look at it that way, then you're not going to get, you're not going to stumble during an investigation. You're not going to be better, manipulated. Better, right. yeah, here's a timeline. Ellen's last minute's alive. 2.30, she makes a cell phone call to a local restaurant. And at 4.46, her laptop was used. And the question we're going to look at going forward is, did she actually log on to the laptop or did someone log on for her to make it look as though something's different to develop an alibi? At 4.54, Sam goes to the gym in the building and they've got a video at 454 stays about a half an hour a little bit more comes out at around 530 all right and then he tries to get back into the car into the apartment at around 532 yep now at 532 he calls and he texts Ellen to let him in numerous times because apparently he was knocking on the door and she didn't answer the door. He, he couldn't get in because there was a swing lock what's a swing bar? swing lock if you Ever been in a, a motel or a hotel? Yeah. It's one of those little locks that kind of swings over to the left and it hooks with a little, like, nipple. But most people won't be able to get in if they really want to get but in. But it's effective because if you want to if you want to get into a, a lock like that, you've got to... you got to kick the door gotta, in. You've got to do some damage. At 554, Sam goes, tries to convince the security guard to help... He's not leaving his post. Help him get in. Oh, that's why. That's why he, he, he couldn't leave. If he comes down. He says, I can't get into my, my condo. I need you to I need you to help me. And the guy says, no, I'm not going to leave my post. Absolutely. So that's why he refuses. So Sam kicks in the door by himself at 630. And according to his story, he finds Ellen dead in the kitchen. However, when, when you look at the crime scene photo, which I did, if you kick a door in that's locked, not only will the small inward frame of the door break yep. but the whole door jam if thinking. the lock yep. is on properly the whole door jam is going to break because the lock is going to prevent you from getting in so you're going to do a lot of damage on both sides so what you could do and, and i've been to crime scenes i've been to many crime scenes that were staged a lot of drug addicts will claim people broke into their house and stole their drugs uh, i've been to a crime scene where a boyfriend said that his girlfriend died of a drug overdose. The house was immaculate. She was on the ground. It looked as though she had died of a drug overdose. Yeah. However, he cleaned up the crime scene. He placed her body on the ground. She died of multiple trauma to her stomach area. He kicked her about 100 times. But initially, it looked like a drug overdose. Right. That's what, it, And she was a known drug user. So something might look a certain way. Now, in that case... She, she looks like she's, I mean, is that going to turn up before the autopsy? On the situation I just spoke of, we actually had a medical examiner come into the house before they moved anything. Why is that? Because we initially thought he was giving us the true story, but then we spoke to a neighbor and the neighbor nonchalantly said, well, gee, I heard a very loud argument this morning at seven in the morning. And there was a lot of kicking and screaming going on. Kicking and screaming. Kicking and screaming, but she, she never called the police department. Wow. So we, we brought a medical doctor and he just touched her stomach. And he touched the back of her head and and he knew right there that something was amiss. Really? So an educated eye can make a determination. So in this case, in Ellen's apartment, educated eye would say that breakage of the door happened from the inside and it was possibly instructed that way by whoever made the call, i.e. Sam, and it didn't happen from the outside. The door was not broken from the outside. It was actually unlocked, but he made it look like it was All broken, right. but he didn't do his homework and he did it incorrectly. All right. Uh, back to Sam. He makes a 911 call. At 6.30 or so, he calls uh, 911. Yes. His fiance is not breathing and that, he may, that she may have stabbed herself because there was a knife in her chest. Police arrive 10 minute, uh, 11 minutes later, 6.41, and she is pronounced dead shortly thereafter. The timeline is verified via video. Yes. However, nobody is seen entering the building or entering the yeah, entering There the is no suspicious people either entering at the time, at this timeline, or exiting the building, meaning if an unknown offender did it, which we're going to get into shortly, then you may have seen him or her enter or exit the building. The only one you really see on the video is Sam. Based on Sam's 911 call, responding officers are dispatched to a call of a person not breathing, possible suicide. The first mistake the cops probably made was they get the call and they say, over the radio, respond to a suspected suicide based on the caller. Yep. Sam says yeah. 
my girlfriend committed suicide. I, yeah, I think she committed suicide. So they go in. Here's what I think. Yes. Nice neighborhood. Absolutely. Nice neighborhood. Uh, high rent district. Possible suicide. What a cop should never do is go in there assuming anything. A cop has to go in there objectively, look at any situation from a from a robbery, from a domestic situation, from a, a suicide to a homicide, look at it from both sides of the fence, regardless of what the reporting party says to you, whether on scene or via a phone call. Yeah. In this you instance, go, we they back. went in with the mindset of suicide. We go back to your creed that you live your life by. Don't believe anyone. Well, in law enforcement, you can't afford to, to, to believe everyone until proven otherwise. Cops get there. Ellen's in a semi-upright position. Yeah, kind of slumped against a couple of kitchen cabinets. However, during the 911 conversation that Sam was having, he told the 911 operator that she was on the ground and they were going over CPR protocol. So that's your first little thing that should click right. into the head of a responding because, officer. Because you don't do, if you're doing CPR, if you're trying to respond, they have to be flat on the ground on their flat. back. Now, let me ask you this question. Sam's traumatized. Back from the gym, seizes his girlfriend. He's freaked out. Absolutely, Traumatized. absolutely. In those situations, your mind can play tricks on you. And you can say the wrong you thing. You can say the wrong thing. So police spend an hour, maybe a little bit less, processing the scene. Because they believe, based on what Sam told them, and they believe based on probably just seeing the knife in her chest, and, and a knife wound is going to bleed. Yeah. And they didn't do anything other than that. A little cursory look on the crime scene, 20, and they cleared it as a suicide. All right, 20. 20 knife wounds. Yes. 20 knife wounds. Well, if she's on her back, you're not necessarily going to see him from the back. I'm not trying to justify what the cop did or didn't do. Obviously, right. it yeah. was horrible investigatory work yeah. by the police department and the, re and the responding officer and the so-called responding detective. They dropped the ball from the beginning of this call because yep. they had a predetermined thought in their head and that's how they handled it. This is like a murder mystery from a tel from television. You know, the person dies in a locked in a, in, in a locked room. I think those are Sherlock Holmes. Somebody died in a locked room. Okay. How did they die? If it wasn't suicide. The, the detective sure. probably spoke to the officer on scene and said, what do you got? The officer said, well, the boyfriend said it was a suicide. The detective said, well, anything looks suspicious? Well, she's dead on the ground. She has a knife in her chest. There's a lot of blood. Well, it's a suicide. But what they should have done and what they didn't do, they should have secured the scene. The detective should have been on scene. They could have done blood patent evidence, how the blood will yeah. spurt in different sure. directions and how it will go against the wall. DNA. Yep. whether it be Sam's DNA, Ellen's DNA, or an unknown offender's right. and, DNA. And, and by the way, in this case, if you've got Sam's DNA... He's going to have it there because he boy, lives yeah, there. It's boyfriend. It's it's not. And he's gonna he's tried CPR, so his DNA should be on and, her. And his fingerprints are going to be on her. I mean, if you go there and you do DNA and you find Sam and Ellen and another person... Yes. And all of a sudden, your Spider-Man theory comes back to play. Um, what they also didn't do, they, they didn't secure Ellen, Ellen's cell phones uh, or computers. And we're going to get into yeah, that this very is just, quickly. This is almost like an assumption like they made, which is they, they're assuming that the story that they got from the television producer boyfriend yes. is accurate from they, the start. They didn't. I, I'm not sure how they interviewed him, but I believe... They did not bring him back to the station because you never interview someone at a crime scene. You bring him in an environment where the police control the environment. But let me ask you this question. He's the grieving boyfriend of a suicide victim. You need to be compassionate in law enforcement. However, you need to be thorough and you need to run a parallel investigation, suicide investigation and a homicide investigation, regardless of whether you sympathize with his current right. situation. So what else have you got? To wrap up, please respond. We've already concluded that it was inept, it was inadequate, and they took Sam's word for it that it was a suicide. And they should have looked at it in both directions. But there are four glaring deficiencies in what they did. First of all, in the police report, it says deadbolt lock. It was not a deadbolt lock. I previously described it as a lock right. that flipped over from left to right. Second, police said in their report that the security guard witnessed Sam kicking in the door and breaking the lock. Yep. When in fact, the security guard never left his post. That's another bit of evidence. Yeah. It was a statement by a coroner that supported the police's theory of suicide. However, there is no evidence that that particular coroner ever examined the body. And the last one, police most likely intimidated or strongly influenced the coroner to change the manner of death from homicide to suicide, because if that's the case, 
any deficiencies that the cops had when they were on scene are going to be covered up. So does it lead one to believe that the Philadelphia Police Department and the offices that did this investigation are corrupt? They're corrupt to a certain extent to include the medical examiner who allowed her name on the report. But how much of this is, you get there, you've got a locked room, you've got a dead person inside. But it's you have locked. a locked room based well, on what the information Sam had, gave I to, you. I had to break the lock to get in. The yes. lock is broken. You haven't taken a look, close look at it. Why do, why, do you, why do you go to homicide first and not suicide? You don't go to anything first. You observe the scene and then let the scene tell you what okay. happened. So then, not what the boyfriend says to you. Right. Let the scene tell you. The scene will tell the story. All right, so now now the next day comes. Now the next day it comes. Gives more, it, it, again, if you believe that everything was done incorrectly and sloppily. You can never certainly backtrack. It was done, certainly it was done quickly. It was yes. done quickly. The next day, the crime scene was cleaned. It was cleaned by an, by, independent, by an independent contract. crime scene services. And the uncle, yeah. Sam's uncle, who was a lawyer, now currently a judge in the Philadelphia area, will give his name James Schwartzman. He went to the apartment. He had the apartment cleaned. He took Ellen's computer and her cell phone. He's not a dumb guy. He's yeah. a lawyer. In his head... He's doing what the cops are doing. He's thinking suicide, but then he probably understands what happened. And he's thinking, my nephew that. could have killed this young well, girl. So he grabs the, the computer and, thought, and the he cell phone. He could have thought the nephew did it and did it. But you're right. Attorneys being the way that they are, he's going to be a, a prime suspect. I'm going to grab the cell phone just in case. And it's going to be. You just wipe everything clean. Yeah. Any type of text messages that might have happened. Anything on the computer that might have happened. Yeah. I will say this, that they did find some information on the cell phone. They did find some information on the computer. But once you grab a piece of evidence and you pull it from a crime scene and there's a chain of custody that is broken, that evidence is not going to be able to be used in most court proceedings. However, there has never been a court proceeding up to this point. Right. Obviously, he knew something. Maybe he knew something or maybe he suspected something. Um, means. Yes. Now we're, we're getting do, into we're means, do. opportunity, and motive. Okay. Now, we already spoke about the means earlier. However, Ellen was stabbed 20 times. 10 to the back of the neck, and 10 to the front, the chest, and the abdomen area. Can somebody physically stab themselves? I mean, I know you can slice your back, in the back of the neck. but If you're a contortionist, I'm going to get into shortly about types of suicide and what I've seen in uh, law enforcement. But yes, people do stab themselves. Yes, you can stab yourself in various parts of your body. So when you look at 10 to the back, 10 to the front, no apparent struggle, meaning she didn't have any defense wounds on her. Yep. So that would tell an investigator that she was probably attacked from the back first in a blitz attack. A blitz attack is someone comes from behind, you don't see them. And there was so much force and ferocity and overkill that before you even know what's going on, you're in capacitated. You cannot defend a blitz attack, All right, especially right. from the back. Now, many of the wounds would have caused death. And, and the big red flag here, there are some wounds on her body that did not bleed. If you get stabbed and your heart is pumping, that means wherever you were stabbed, there's going to be signs of blood in that area. Mm -hmm. If you're already dead and your heart is stopped pumping, wherever you are stabbed, you're going to see a different type of stab wound because there's no blood in that area. She had stab wounds in which the coroner, an independent coroner, stated that she was already dead. Her heart was already stopped when she was stabbed. How can you stab yourself when you're dead? You can't do it. That's interesting. Uh, suicide, suicide theory, theory for us. But before we get into that, Depressed people, people who want to end their lives, they will go to great lengths to kill themselves. Some of the suicides that I've been on, people will walk in front of trains, they'll walk down the highway, cars are going 80 miles an hour, they'll walk into a car. And what a train or a high-speed motor vehicle will do to a body is completely blow it up. There'll be limbs all over right. oh, the yeah. area. People will hang themselves, people will shoot themselves. Yep. People will cut off a limb and people will stab themselves. You can stab yourself in the leg five times. You can stab yourself in the forearm and in the shoulder five times. So now you have a person who's been stabbed 10 times by themselves. But the last time you stab yourself is okay. usually going to be the killing wound. Stab yourself in the chest, in the heart, slice your throat. So people will stab themselves 10 or 15 times. When you say Ellen was stabbed 20 times, that's 
possible to stab yourself 20 times, but not where she was stabbed, not right. to the back of, of your right. head, yeah. back of your right. neck, into your spine, into your skull. Absolutely not. Right. The angle doesn't make any sense. See, yeah, she's not a contortionist. She wasn't on PCP, meaning she had no pain threshold and she had superhuman strength. However, the theory ran with itself because it was based on Sam's initial report yeah. and incompetent police work well, you keep at the saying scene. Incompetent. We might say incompetent, we may say lazy. So the suicide theory, and this is based on medical experts that were hired independently by Ellen's family, is that the wounds to the back of her neck were impossible. You may be able to stab yourself one time, but the other nine or ten, just the sheer pain and what's going to happen to you when you insert yeah. the knife into your brain, you're going to lose bodily functions. And to go eight or nine or ten more times, physically not possible to have those wounds self-inflicted by Ellen. That means someone else did it. All right. So you know the bottom line with the suicide theory, from a rookie cop to a first year medical student, the suicide theory is an embarrassment to all good people in the law enforcement and medical profession because it didn't happen that way. It was physically impossible for Ellen to inflict those wounds on herself based on independent medical evidence. All right, so now we look at opportunity. And we know that if it wasn't suicide, the only other way that Ellen died was by homicide, either by somebody she knew or by that stranger, that yes. Spider-Man that we talked Absolutely. about Absolutely. So right. let's look at the stranger homicide possibility. Entry into the apartment could only have been gained via the front door or by scaling a six-story building during a snowstorm. As for the scaling of the building, I mean, do we really have to go there, Dave? The police report mentioned inside... Yes of the apartment, that there was no signs of snow or wetness. They were ruling out the stranger. Huh? Absolutely, they're ruling that out. As for the front door, the police and Sam are both sticking to their statements that the door was locked from the inside. So the police and Sam are saying, oh no, no one could have came in because it was locked from the inside. So that doesn't, that doesn't help Sam's case because right. if there's no stranger and it wasn't a suicide, sure. then who was it? Now, there's no video evidence of an unknown person in the building at the alleged time of the murder. With that being said, Dave, a mysterious unknown killer is really not even in the cards. And another thing that I looked at, I looked at that area of Philadelphia, and you would think a sadistic overkill homicide like this if it was an unknown offender if it was a stranger that person may strike again there are no similar homicides in that area that fit mo of how ellen was killed now there are people in philadelphia who were killed on the street by knives during that time but there were street level crimes crime high crime neighborhoods gang type incidents drug rips people were stabbed but not like Ellen was stabbed. Like I said, you would think crazy psychotic offender like that would strike again, but they haven't. So this leaves who? What do you think, Dave? I know exactly what you think. It's the fiance. Well, it, it's the most logical explanation because someone killed her. It's the most yeah. logical explanation. Now, the known offender, we talked about known offender in the last podcast. We talked about that the last person to see someone alive is usually at least top on the list as a suspect. Who was the last person to see her alive? As far as we know, the last person to see her alive was Sam. Absolutely. Now, we don't know. A neighbor could have come to the door, knocked on the door. But it's unfortunate at this point the crime scene was mishandled so bad, you're not going to ever know that. Let me go one more step, though. Yes. That neighbor then would have had to lock the door, swing down from his from his uh, balcony to yes. the balcony below and either go from there to his own place yeah, all these or... theories that we're coming up with were just they're they're almost comical because we're trying to we're trying to explain what happened by filling in the blanks after it happened and it, it just makes no logical sense yeah. but like i said you could theorize but it always comes back to who was the last person to see her alive and who set this whole thing in motion with the suicide theory and the locked door. And who had the opportunity. And who had the opportunity. And we're okay. going to get into motive very All shortly. Right. Sam does have an alibi if we're going to go on, on that, Dave. He was at the gym and it can be verified 
through video. Like I said, it doesn't mean he didn't kill her. My thought on this is that he killed her, cleaned himself up, went onto her computer for the last time. Now, when you come into the crime scene and you look at the computer that they got back from the uncle, and that just happened to be there, now you have somewhat of a timeline that, oh, she was alive at 446, so there was really only this half-hour window that Sam could have killed her. But in, in fact, he probably killed her prior to going to the gym and did that little last login on her computer. If you believe in the known offender theory. Absolutely, and the known offender we're talking about is Sam. Also, the coroner's report, and this is the first time we're mentioning it, Ellen had bruises on her body that were not as a result of being stabbed to death. There were older bruises on her body. Now, that could lead someone to believe that she was the victim of domestic violence. And there's something that I I actually missed early on. The suicide theory was brought up by the police department because Ellen was on some anti-anxiety and depression medication. Based on when you're on anti-anxiety and depression meds, one of the side effects is is you could become suicidal. Why was she on that? Did Sam lead her to well, be you know. to, to, to depression and anxiety by yeah. ha- being involved in a domestic with her and sure. abusing her? Let's put it this way. Or she liked rock climbing. There's no evidence that she was involved in anything like that that would lead her to have those bruises. So how did she get them? And in yeah. law enforcement, it's very simple. It's very simple. If you get rid of any possibility and the only other possibility is that you're being abused by your husband, by your boyfriend, by your father, by your mother. That's the logical explanation. It's not, there's no such thing as a mystery. The mystery is when you never have the answer, but something happened for her to get those bruises. It's not a mystery. It's logical that she probably got them from either Sam or if she had another boyfriend. We're going to get into that in motive. (laughs) We're going to get into that in motive. That's, I was already, I was, I was one step ahead of you on that one. Now we're we're at motive, Dave. All right. So motive is. Why was Ellen killed? Why would somebody, why would somebody do this? So suicide, that's out the window. Stranger homicide. We strongly believe that that is out the window based on the simple fact that Sam said the door was locked from the inside and there's no way out of that apartment. All right, I got three motives. First one, did Ellen find out that Sam was having an affair and she told him that she was leaving him? Second one, was Ellen having an affair and Sam found out and that would be a jealousy or a revenge motive. Yeah. I'll give you I'll give you one more. Yes. It takes both of those. Maybe Ellen was having the affair and she said, Yeah, I'm leaving you. Absolutely. That could be another one. The last one, and this is like the hardest one to try to comprehend in, in the average mind, is Sam just a complete psycho and he killed Ellen in a crime of passion because he wanted out of the relationship. Now, this could explain also the bruises. Obviously, if if he's abusing her, then, you know, death isn't always, it's a rare outcome in a domestic situation, but it definitely happens. Sure. But I will say one thing, Sam got married three years after the, after this whole thing was over three years later, he got married, he's married again somewhere out there. But I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking that I believe it hundred percent to be him, that no girl around him is safe because if he is a psycho or a closet psycho, meaning he can just snap out of the blue, then no one is safe around him. Final thought. The bottom line on this case is that the offender probably will never be determined unless there was a deathbed confession by either Sam or someone else. You You know, originally this case wasn't particularly difficult to investigate or solve. In all appearances, an innocent girl, Ellen, and a loving daughter was brutally murdered in her apartment. Cops showed up at the scene. Everything spoke to them. If they had done a thorough investigation, a proper investigation, an investigation that was sympathetic to the victim, was sympathetic to the victim's family, they should have been motivated to solve this case. They should have been motivated to get this killer off the streets, do some justice for the family, because the family... 11, 12 years later, there's no closure here. Right. They're still suffering. They don't know what happened to their daughter. They know what happened to their daughter, but our enforcement isn't recognizing that. Some aspects of the medical community, the ones that are affiliated with the state of Philadelphia, are not recognizing that. At this point, the only justice Ellen's family can hope to achieve is that the autopsy and the overall case status is rightfully changed to unsolved 
homicide. All right, that's Dale Lawrence. I'm Dave Radigan. This has been Crime Solvers. Thank you for tuning in. Like it, share it, tune in to our other podcasts. Inside the Line, Real Stories by Real Cops. We're a little looser over there, a little less serious about this stuff, but we deal with some horrible, horrible things just like we do here.